He had no children of his own, yet every youngster he met called him Uncle Ardo. He was born with the talent to be a gifted artist, working in Hollywood for MGM and then Walt Disney. During World War II, he revolutionized combat training for U.S. troops by building a secret German village in Northern California. At home, in his beloved Adirondack Mountains, Ardo Monaco met his greatest challenge to design and create some of America's first theme parks. One of those parks, Santa's Workshop, saw eager visitors endure traffic jams 47 miles long. Next, Ardo Monaco would design and build a magical theme park, especially for children, right in his own backyard. The phenomenal success of Santa's Workshop and the land of make-believe would ensure Ardo Monaco a place in the history of the Adirondacks and American culture. But what drove Uncle Ardo throughout his life was a personal desire to make every child happy. And he did. By placing the cheerful memories of childhood safe inside the castle he built in every heart. He had an ability to see the world through a child's eyes. If Arno Monaco's goal was to build a castle in every child's heart, it was more important to him than fame or fortune. A castle in every heart is made possible in part by Santa's Workshop, North Pole, New York, America's first theme park, beautifully restored to its former glory. Located on Whiteface Mountain in the heart of New York State's Adirondack Mountains, Knight Cadillac Pontiac GMC, offering a wide array of new and used vehicles to meet the needs of any driver. Certified master technicians complement the Knight team, proud to support Mountain Lake PBS. by Steve and Carol Carpenter, proud to support this and other quality programs on Mountain Lake PBS. And by Northern Car Crushers, a division of George Moore Truck and Equipment Corporation, Keysville, New York. I'm Derek Mearden, producer of the program that you are about to see, which chronicles the life of a fascinating American icon. His name was Arto Monaco, and he had the remarkable ability to make people happy, especially children. Whether it was through his work in making Hollywood movies, or his fascinating educational toys, or as the designer of some of America's very first theme parks, like Santa's Workshop near Lake Placid, New York, or his very own Land of Make-Believe, which he built especially for children right in his own backyard. But what was it about Arto Monaco that made him the favorite uncle to tens of thousands of children and adults alike. And why was it so important to him all his life to make certain each one of us maintain a generous portion of our childhood innocence as long as we lived? <laughs> Come with me.
and let's find out. Once upon a time, in a small village nestled in the foothills of the highest peaks of the Adirondack Mountains in far upstate New York, lived a man whose entire life was dedicated to making people happy. He was born in these mountains, and he is buried in these mountains. His name was Ardo Monaco. There used to be about 40 buildings here about 40. The others are gone down the river. It's a ghost town today. The decaying ruins of Cactus Flats, the western town that was just one part of Ardo Monaco's land of make-believe. At the height of its popularity in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, kids from all over insisted that at least a part of their summer vacations be spent here in a place created just for them. But the land of make-believe was only a drop in the bucket when it came to the genius of Ardo Monaco. For Ardo would be blessed with an entire lifetime of creative adventures. Ardo Monaco was born to an Italian immigrant father and an American mother in Osable Forks, New York, in this house on November 15, 1913. A few years later, his father, Louis Monaco, bought the only grocery store in Upper Jay, a small village a few miles up the main road near the highest peaks of the Adirondack Mountains. The store was soon expanded into a garage and then a restaurant. I don't think there were more than a dozen cars in the whole community because most everyone was driving horse and wagons. At that time, there were three hotels. We didn't have motels in those days. We had three hotels. There was a, a gas station and two garages. There were two restaurants. Uh, there was a pretty good size of the community. Louis's restaurant soon became a popular spot. Celebrities with summer homes nearby, vacationers, and locals alike enjoyed its relaxed atmosphere and good Italian food. Movie director Louis Milestone, the writer John Steinbeck, and premier American illustrator Rockwell Kent were just some of the frequent patrons of Louis's eatery. While in high school, Ardo worked for his dad at the restaurant, but he drew and sketched all kinds of things whenever he could. In high school, I had a room in the study hall, and he used to come in, and he had a seat about three or four down the aisle for me, 
and I watched him. He put a book up like this on his desk, and he was doing cartoons. On the, and I thought, oh, he's going to get caught. I was a nervous wreck. But he did that every time he came to the study hall. He didn't study, he was too busy doing cartoons. Louie had given Ardo the job of painting comical scenes on the walls of the restaurant, and it wasn't long before Rockwell Kent recognized a real talent. One day, uh, Rockwell said to, to my father, who painted those pictures on your wall? And Dad said, my son. And he said, uh, have him stop and see me someday. So I did. I went down to see Rockwell, and he was so nice. And he said, uh, you know, what are you going to do with your life? And he said, would you like to be an artist? In those days, they didn't take it in the Pratt unless you'd been had four years of high school. I hadn't had it. But Mrs. Wells across the street, across the river, her best friend was Mrs. Pratt, who head of Pratt Art School. And Rockwell knew about her, and so they got together, the two of them, and I got a notice of Pratt said, take a test, and they accepted me. So Ardo was enrolled in not just any art school, but the prestigious Pratt Institute of Art in New York City. Here, Ardo was in his element and learned much from classes in drawing, painting, graphic design, and ceramics. He graduated from Pratt in 1937 and returned to working for his father in the restaurant back in Upper J. But it wasn't long before the movie crowd, which frequented Louis, pulled some strings and got Ardo a job as a studio artist in Hollywood. I wanted to go see the West, and I said I was going to go out there because I wanted to do something in the movies. I wasn't interested in being a movie star or something like that, but anything to do with making movies because I loved the movies ever since I was a little tiny kid. But Ardo quickly grew restless with the trappings of Hollywood, working for MGM, Warner Brothers, Paramount, and Disney in quick order before returning home. I was just restless, Ardo would say years later. I was still looking for who I was, I guess. But he wasn't home for long before he met author John Steinbeck and Hollywood movie director Lewis Milestone, who were summering in the Adirondacks while working on the film version of Steinbeck's classic story of Mice and Men. They asked Ardo to illustrate the storyboards for the upcoming production. Ardo returned to Hollywood to finish the project, and there, in 1941, he received his draft notice. Ardo enlisted, with his childhood sweetheart Gladys, now his wife, at his side. The United States Army would never be the same. Master Sergeant Art Monaco, one of those guys that's always getting ideas. Early on in his Army career, Ardo had made the classic mistake of volunteering when his sergeant asked the assembled troops if anyone was an artist. Ardo soon found himself painting signs warning men not to throw cigarette butts in the urinal, but things soon got much better. Ardo went on volunteering again and again, but now he volunteered ideas, like making a large working model of a camera lens so Signal Corps cameramen could better understand the workings of their equipment. His biggest Army project, however, found Sergeant Monaco designing and building a secret training facility for soldiers about to depart for the European theater during World War II. In the California pine country, he designed and built Anadorf, a full-scale German village complete with pop-up Nazi snipers. For some reason or other, they put a lot of trust in me. And uh, they said, Monica, we want you to design a park, a village, where you can train these boys to do a street fighting. 
Ardo's military efforts resulted in his being awarded the Legion of Merit for his remarkable skills and talent. Not just his creative solutions to practical problems, but his leadership skills as well. It seemed the talented young artist from the Adirondacks was finally beginning to find out who he was and what he wanted to do with his life. Back in Upper J, Ardo worked for Rockwell Kent as the artist's assistant at Kent's studio and dairy farm, Asgard. Ardo had also worked there for Kent during his summer breaks from the Pratt Institute. And he wanted me to paint a picture of his stables and things like that. And I went out there and, you know, a lazy summer day and I just uh, slopped it together. Rocco came along and said, how are you coming? And I said, oh, pretty good. He said, let me take your brush. And he took my brush and he did. He said, okay, now start over again. And this time, you'll paint it like you see it. But it wasn't long before Ardo struck out on his own. On the ground floor of an old hotel in Upper J, Ardo started the Ardo Monaco Toy Company and produced wooden creations like this steamroller. The toys came unassembled, but could be put together by hand with no tools needed. Only thing was, there were no instructions included. These simple designs, which required the child to think about how to put them together, soon kept Ardo, his brother Jimmy, and wife Glad busy filling orders for their colorful, educational toys. Then, one day, a man walked into the toy factory with an idea that would change Ardo's life. The idea of the park originated in a story that my father had told my youngest sister, Patty, when she was about five years old. It was a story about a magical little baby bear who had wandered and gotten lost and discovered uh, this little magical village surrounding a North Pole uh, and finding happy people there, busy elves, and of course a man in a red suit who was in charge. Well, that was the original story, and my sister uh, uh, said, well, I'd like to go there, too. That sounds like a great place to visit. She asked my father if he could drive her there, and he said, no, there's no roads. Uh, well, could you fly me in your airplane? No, there's no airport. I can't land there. Uh, well, how about a train? No, there's no train ramp up there. So uh, she said, that's terrible. That would be the best thing ever to do. Uh, and she fell asleep, and while driving through the then Christmas decorated the little villages, my father began to think, wouldn't any child love an opportunity to see Santa in his own home? When uh, my father had this idea, he just had the, the theme in his mind. Uh, through uh, other people he was introduced, suggested that he go down and talk to Ardo Monaco. And so dad had his first visit with Ardo Monaco probably around 1946. He told me about an idea he had for building a children's village based on the theme of Santa Claus. And Ardo was later told me after he said he thought the man was crazy. <laughs> Mr. Rice came in and he was not very well dressed. I looked at his hat and I looked at his clothes and his tech tie was a screw and I looked out and he had a beat up old Chevrolet. Now, of course he's a, a very rich man. But he didn't, he was like Howard Hughes. He just liked to go around just like the common man. My father was notorious for uh, going around in baggy old suits and driving a secondhand car and so forth. So Ardo was a little bit concerned that maybe this man was, had dreams that were not too realistic. And he said, well, uh, you make up some sketches because I want to take them show my father in New York. Well, he was back the next day. And he said to me, I said, well, how did you dig Go see your father that fast, you must have drove all night. He said, oh no, I flew my private plane down. <laughs> I hear I'm thinking he's almost <laughs> destitute. And so finally, we designed North Pole and opened it, and it was a great success. Julian Rice soon gathered a team of experts, or elves, if you will, to build, manage, and promote Santa's workshop. Here, a creative session is presided over by Santa himself, with Ardo the designer, Julian the visionary, 
and manager Harold Fortune, the marketing expert, listening carefully to the chief elf's every word. What started out as a clever fable about Santa's summer home made up to amuse a child, soon started taking shape through the fertile mind of Ardo Monaco. Ardo even went so far as to build meticulous scale models of what some of the workshop buildings should look like. No blueprints were ever made for the construction of anything at the park. Ardo merely drew sketches of how everything should look. From St. Nicholas's Chapel, to the reindeer barn, to Santa's home. In some cases, Ardo would even create a cutaway drawing for an interior, like this one for the snack shop. Much of the wood cut from the lot during the clearing was used in the log house type construction of the buildings. The footprints of each building were merely stepped off and then marked with stakes and string. Details of everything were drawn up by Ardo and then delivered to workers on site. Here, for example, is Ardo's original sketch for a chimney with some of the stucco purposely left off to expose the brick beneath it, giving the chimney a weathered look. In the practical application, the faux chimney works great and looks real. Note the rough cut lumber roofing, as well as the birch limbs bark and all framing the window. The jigsaw cut frame pieces, as well as the wavy roof peak toppings, combine to give the whole village a storybook look. Ardo even sketched many of the costumes for the various inhabitants of the place. From Little Bo Peep, with a flock of real sheep, to the toy maker. But there were others behind the concept, construction, and popularity of the park. Here, Julian Rice on the left, his father Xavier Rice, a tailor whose fortune from inventing the off-the-rack sizing guide for men's clothing financed the park, and Patty Rice, Julian's daughter, and the little girl who first heard the story of Santa's summer home strike a pose on opening day. Gonna look for Santa. Where you gonna track him down? Want him now? Tell you how. Go find the North Pole town. Where you gonna find old Whiskers? Where is it he hangs around? Want to see? Just follow me, and you'll be a North Pole town. The first day, a couple hundred people arrived. Uh, in the original planning of the park, they were talking about maybe three or four hundred visitors a day. During the first year, uh, the attendance grew steadily day after day. As the word got out, mostly by mouth, of what's this unusual thing that's been done on the side of Whiteface Mountain. Someone has actually built a fairy tale village there. And uh, so people began coming in increasing numbers. Uh, as I said, the first year was 1949, in July. Uh, by the end of that year, we were looking at several thousands of people in one day. In Labor Day Sunday of 1951, uh, was the la single largest day's attendance, uh, came to close to 14,000 people in one day. Uh, so far beyond the three or 400 people they estimated <laughs> that uh, it was uh, so, so much for business plans. <laughs> Santa's workshop was a hit. Ardo's design had made a simple childhood story come to life on the slopes of Whiteface Mountain in the Adirondacks. If you go through the park, you'll see nothing but happy children walking around with their parents or their, their cousins, and you see clusters of people, you know, um, walking through the park, laughing and playing and being amazed, and small children just with their eyes glazed over like a deer in the headlights staring at something magical, you know, like, a, like Frosty the Snowman. You know, as an adult, it's a little hokey, but through their eyes, it's pure magic. It's absolutely pure magic. I'm hoping someday I'll have grandkids that I can take here. You know, I was thinking about that just today, that how much easier it would be to have one of my children carry the load 
you know, and, and I get to just sit back, you know, because now I'm loading trucks and carrying suitcases and running for candy and where are my, where's my coat, where's my hat? If I could just stand there with the camera and let everyone else scatter and do those things, that would be pure magic, you know. So sure, hopefully one day that'll happen for me, you know. But until then, I'm going to enjoy every minute of this. <laughs> Now, Ardo would visit Santa's workshop over the years to design additional buildings or to do a little touch-up on the ones that already existed. But all the while, he had an idea bubbling away in the back of his head to design a very special theme park all of his own. But before he could get started, there came one more visit from Julian Rice. Soon, Ardo found himself working on another Julian Rice project, Old McDonald's Farm, up the road in Lake Placid. The farm was chock-a-block with furry, friendly animals and was one of the country's first petting zoos. But it required a lot of cages, coops, and corrals. It was Ardo who had to figure how to make them all safe and attractive to both animal and visitor. Toward the end of the project up at Old McDonald's Farm, Arda was driving home one night along this road. He was giving a lift to his young friend Kate Cameron, who also worked at the park. And Arda said to her, you know, Kate, I'm tired of building chicken coops. I want to build something strictly for kids. Well, Kate sat in rapt attention as Arda told her all about the land of make-believe. I said, if I had the money, I'd build a park and it would be strictly for kids, kids up to 12 years old. And if their father and mother want to come, they can come with them, but it's a kid's park. The kids take the parents to the park, not the parents take the kids to the park. And I said, everything would be down to half scale. All the buildings and the little ponies, little stage coaches, everything down to scale. And she said, gee, that's a great idea. That night, Kay told her parents about Ardo's land of make-believe. Her dad, Ewan Cameron, a successful local businessman, told his daughter to have Ardo come see him. Mr. Cameron liked the idea, and he liked Ardo. Within days, Cameron made a direct cash investment and set up a line of credit at a local bank. He also made Catherine a partner in the venture, 50-50 with Ardo Monaco. Kay kept an eye on the park's books while Ardo designed and saw to the construction of the land of make-believe. Kay Cameron and Ardo Monaco would grow close over the years and remained lifelong friends. <laughs> the summer and fall of 1953, the little valley at the foot of Ebenezer Mountain, along the banks of the east branch of the Osable River, echoed with the sounds of hammers and saws. Again, there would be no blueprints, just drawings, string, stakes, and the fertile imagination of Ardo Monaco. It was 1954, and Ardo had his park. Or, more accurately, the children had their park. The land of make-believe was filled with wonderful things. A storybook town with the homes of fabled storybook characters like Peter the Pumpkin Eater and the Three Bears. A paddle wheel steamer called the Billabong Bell that plied the waters of the nearby river. And real steam trains to transport visitors. An amazing scale model western town called Cactus Flats with its ice cream saloon, chapel, 
and firehouse with a working hand-pumped fire cart, and of course, regular stage service. At its very center was the jewel of the park, a great big castle with spires that seemed to reach into the clouds, a castle where kids could dress up and be anyone they wished, real or imagined. And everywhere, signs that warned of nothing but more fun. The first day was pretty exciting and you know, I walked, strutted around here in a big cowboy hat and cowboy boots. <laughs> I think we had, oh, I don't know, 500 people. And we thought, boy, we were really sailing. No, I was loving every minute of it. It was such fun. I enjoyed every minute of it. When you first enter the land of make-believe, the castle's right there, and the, the little train is going, and you can see the, the village where the butcher, the baker, the, and the pumpkin house, and it, it, it's just magical. To me, the land of make-believe was like the biggest playground in the world. It was, you know, you could, you could go wherever you wanted because they had a very hands-on approach to it, you know. There was never, don't touch this, don't touch that. You could play with whatever you wanted to. It was so personal, I guess you'd call it. And everyone who came here felt, well, they're part of it. And, I, you know, that, that feeling of entering the land and you just would start running. You would run to the western town or you would run to the castle. And almost always it was to the castle first. Everybody had to go into the castle and it, it was always amazing. And you would see families with a blanket and spread out on the lawn, sitting in the, one of the many Adirondack chairs that were, were under a shade tree, having lunch, and the kids were running wild in the background, uh, going in and out of buildings that were to childlike scale that, frankly, most parents couldn't fit through the front door, and it wasn't intended for them. I have employees that still come back here today they stay and visit and reminisce. They like to reminisce about the old days. There were three of us that started in that uh, parking lot in the summer of 1954, uh, parking cars at the, at the Land of Make Believe. So my contact with the, with the park was as an employee in what was a, a fabulous job. Frankly, it was a great place to work. You were outdoors all the time. Ardo was a wonderful person to work for. I ran most all of the rides over the course of the I think it was about 10 years I worked there. I ran every ride at some point, with the exception of the horse-drawn rides. Uh, my favorite was by far the fire truck. I, I, that's probably the biggest regret of not having the land and make-believe there is that my kids don't have a place to work because those were some very special memories. And to have a job like that, in a way, it kind of spoils you for life because, you know, to have that much fun and uh, working with that group of people and for Ardo in such a creative atmosphere as a first job, it was fantastic. The truth of the matter was, was a lot of us would have worked for free because it was that much fun. <laughs> For years, Santa's workshop built on the mountainside and the land of make-believe built in the valley below spun their summer magic for generations of kids. But the land of make-believe, which bordered the east branch of the Osable River, had a vulnerable side. After a rare, but particularly snowy, cold winter, this peaceful mountain stream could become a torrent of destruction. A few warm days, even in the middle of winter, could get the snow melting and the ice moving. And if the ice jammed,
the water behind it kept coming. And quicker than anyone could react, the water rushed around the ice dam, over the road, across the low-lying meadows, and right through the land of make-believe. The floods, with varying degrees of intensity, continued to plague the land of make-believe over the years. But Ardo vowed to open each spring, and for 25 memorable years, he did just that. And I would think each spring, after the water had ruined him practically, he'd like to throw his hands in the air and say, I've had it, but he jump right back in and fix it all over again. But in Ardo's mind, the floods didn't have to happen at all. The main thing would be to deepen those channels a little bit. And the APA and all those people came to a meeting and they were going to do great things. Well, they didn't do anything. They didn't get the right permits and all this and that and they hem and hawed around and it's just a run around. And they even had nerve enough to say, well, they didn't want to dig the channel out there now because it might disturb the spawning of the fish and they would die. Well, let me tell you, when I had the flood here, it was thousands of fish frozen in the ice out here, so they died anyway. Hello, Lana Minkley. In the winter of 1978-79, the east branch of the Osable River struck the fatal blow. Ice and water five feet deep rushed through the land of make-believe, ripping buildings from their foundations and crushing them like matchsticks as the churning ice and water rumbled downstream. Many pieces of the land of make-believe were never found, washed away forever including Ardo's original drawings for the park and all of his drawings he had brought back from his work in Hollywood. It was a crushing blow, one Ardo Monaco knew he could not survive. Not this time. And land of make-believe was kept right up to the finish. And so when it went out, it went out when it was the top of the glory. You know, it was really on, on the pinnacle. So people can't say, well, they went out because they were bad business people, or they went out because they didn't care anymore, or they went out because they made a lot of money and decided to close it. We went out because Mother Nature just said, that's it, Arnold. This last flood we had, if we were sitting here right now, uh, it would be over your head. It was way up to here. There's a watermark right along there.
But Mother Nature wasn't quite through with Ardo Monaco and the land of make-believe. Not yet. The park was destroyed beyond repair and did close for good after the floods in the winter of 1978-79. But the river would rise again in early 1998. And this time, it almost seemed that the water and ice were coming after Ardo himself and his wife, Glad. I've seen about, uh, Ardo, what does this remind you of? Oh, gee, listen, you know what? This is, uh, I've seen about 12, 14 floods, and this is the worst ever. <laughs> Had you caught over there? Huh? You were trapped over there? Yeah, that's why we wanted to finish this up. Going right in the house. It's the end. I've had enough floods in there. Hello, Land of Make Believe. I'm terribly sorry, sir. Land of Make Believe is closed. They had a terrible flood here and wiped them out of business. Yeah. Okay, bye bye. All day long, this goes on. And when they do call, I usually make up a souvenir package. I have some made and we mail it off to them at least. Ardo put a brave face on the closing of the land of make-believe, but it hurt him to do it. Not for what the place meant to him, but for what closing the park would mean for the tens of thousands of kids who could no longer come and visit. And this is a God's honest truth. People call here and say, I was at your place uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and I want to bring my grandchildren. I say, it's no longer in existence. You know, I've had several people break down and cry, and I have to wait for them to continue their conversation. They were so disappointed because they wanted to come back here. See, Land of Maple Leaf was different than most parks. It was strictly built for children. Oh, yeah, I have great memories of it, and I think I miss, I miss uh, going out there and seeing all these kids having a good time, because I sort of still a kid myself. Whether he realized it or not before he said it, Ardo's ability to always see things through the eyes of a child is what made his life's work so magical. His whole mind was what was Land of Make Believe. I mean, there was nothing else, nobody else created anything that was at Land of Make Believe. Ardo was always in touch with not only with you, but he wasn't, he wasn't older than you were, he was younger than you were. He was always interested in, in the kid and you. He had an ability to see the world through a child's eyes that you just simply cannot fake. Um, you know, the detail in the Western Village and, and, and the, the placement of the signs, they were at eye level, but they were at eye level for an eight-year-old. Even when he had the, his biggest troubles, when the river came down and washed out his businesses, uh, that he had, his business had land to make believe that he had put so much of himself into, he still never lost his compassion for other people. I think that the, the magical thing about Ardo was that he was always a kid at heart. He never completely grew up. He always had one foot in, in childhood. Well, the theme park is, was sort of like a big toy to me. Yeah. But uh, the theme park was, uh, it was a lot of fun building it. Mm -hmm. And it was too bad to see it end. Mm -hmm. But uh, you got to get on with other things. On to other things indeed. During the heyday of the land of make-believe, and for more than 30 years after it closed, Ardo's talents were continually in demand. He built elaborate scale models of castles for use in a variety of Hollywood films. And his skills at working with wood, crafting prototypes of literally hundreds of children's toys, always kept Ardo busy. But the toys I quite often test out on kid. Kids are honest. They'll say, well, I don't like it. <laughs> and that may hurt your feelings, but they know more about it than an adult would. He was even hired to build props for magazine photo shoots like this one for Imperial Whiskey. Ardo built the one horse sleigh and both Uncle Ardo and Aunt Glad were hired to ride in the sleigh for the shoot. The advertisement appeared 
full page in several popular magazines of the day. After the final flood, other theme parks sought out Ardo's talents, like longtime friend and amusement park owner Charlie Wood, who bought much of what wasn't destroyed in the land of make-believe floods, installing them in his own theme park in Glens Falls, New York, and then hiring Ardo each summer to keep things in shape. Yes, the phone kept ringing, and Ardo kept busy. Well, I had a great deal of fun building all these things. And maybe I'll keep on building some, who knows? It's all up to good Lord. If he wants me to, I'll keep on building. If he don't, that'll be in. Yep. But he was such a thoughtful, good person. I was lucky to have him. On Friday morning, November 21, 2003, surrounded by his wife and family, Ardo Monaco died just a few days after celebrating his 90th birthday. Ardo Monaco was, without question, a remarkable man because somehow he managed to keep one thing from his childhood, which would guide him throughout his entire life the realization that all children are born innocent and remain so until some outside force, often in tandem with growing up, conspires to exchange the often harsh reality of adulthood for the magical fantasies of childhood. And once the innocent fantasies of childhood are lost, they are lost forever. Ardo knew this. And almost everything he created, he created for children. Santa's workshop, Old MacDonald's farm, his educational toys, and the land of make-believe. They were Ardo's efforts to keep us all young for as long as possible. And therein lies the genius of Ardo Monaco. For no matter how old we got, he always had a way of bringing us back to our childhoods, a time when our imaginations fueled the fires of our fantasies. And he understood why it was so important that we always have a castle in our hearts. Because where else could we go to relive some of the best times of our lives? To laugh, to play, and be a kid again. A castle in every heart is made possible in part by Santa's Workshop, North Pole, New York, America's first theme park, 
beautifully restored to its former glory. Located on Whiteface Mountain in the heart of New York State's Adirondack Mountains, Knight Cadillac Pontiac GMC, offering a wide array of new and used vehicles to meet the needs of any driver. Certified master technicians complement the Knight team, proud to support Mountain Lake PBS. By Steve and Carol Carpenter, proud to support this and other quality programs on Mountain Lake PBS. And by Northern Car Crushers, a division of George Moore Truck and Equipment Corporation, Keysville, New York.